Hi there, and uh, thanks for joining us. As most of you are here because for some reason or other, or some way or other, your company needs or builds software, right? So show of hands, how many people believe that their company's strategic value is at least 50% based on software they create? Okay, good. Sometimes you'll hear the, the phrase, you know, we're all in the software business, or every company is a software company, no matter what you do. And so many people are here to learn, how do I, how do, I do this better? How do I do it faster? How do I do it more effectively? And, and, you know, the subtitle of my talk is how leaders do continuous delivery to get ahead, not just go faster. And this is why I do this talk. So it turns out that the answer to these questions is actually not something we need, we need to figure out. It's something that's been being done already. So the future is already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. And what, that, what I mean by that is that there's companies that have been doing what I'm going to tell you about for a decade or more, and yet what I'm going to describe to you is still considered unusual or new, or we'll have to look into it, and uh, hopefully by the end you'll have sort of a different opinion about that, about, about how real this is and wh about whether you should be applying it. And you may be applying some of this, but try to look at the totality of what we're going to talk about today. So what do all these leaders have in common, right? Well, they're all really big, they all grow really fast, they all make an awful lot of money online, and they all do continuous delivery. They all build software faster and deliver it more often, right? And I would submit to you that the speed, the number of releases they do, that's not the issue. The issue there's a reason why they're doing that fast. The reason we do continuous delivery is actually for a feedback loop. We want to try something, see how it went, and then try again. And we want that that to be not 18 months, not six months, not three months. We want that to be days or hours if we can, right? So what they all have in common is something called progressive delivery. Now, progressive delivery is really, it's, this isn't uh, too hard to grasp. Just think about being able to control the release of your software and observe how it's going at the user level, a user at a time. So instead of I'm releasing this software to all my users, I'm going to cross my fingers because I'm going to throw the switch. Here goes the Big Bang release. Actually, show of hands, how many people have a release night that's done after hours or on a weekend or something like that where you release your software when it's quiet for your customers? Right, OK. Um, so another quick survey. How many people have actually been in what they call a war room? In the US, we call this a war room, which is there's an incident underway, and we actually have gathered people together to try to figure out how it's go what's going on, right? OK, war room. Uh, how many people were in that for an hour or more? OK, what about four hours or more? OK, so they can go on for quite a while, right? What if you didn't have to do that? So that's just, I'll put that as a provocative thing. So progressive delivery can be broken down into three pillars. I want to manage, and we'll talk about this, how do I decouple deployment from release? So I want to actually manage the gradual exposure at, at the user level, and I want to be able to change that exposure without doing a new deployment. I don't want to change my deployment. I don't want to change my infrastructure. I don't want to change my network routing. I just want to have my app out there, and I want to be able to turn a dial up and down about who gets it, um, and, and I want to be able to do that through what we might call managing. I want to monitor. So in this different paradigm, traditional monitoring kind of breaks down. And we'll see, I'll show an example of that in a little bit. But I want to de detect the unforeseen issues that I find that I can only find in production. But I want to find that fast. And I want to do something called limiting the blast radius, right? I want to actually, it's OK if I hurt just a few people and stop it fast versus actually rolling something out to everybody and bringing the whole system down, right? And then finally, the third pillar is to be able to experiment. In this way, I want to confirm the impact of a new initiative before I check the done box and I move on. Like, we're so, sometimes we're in such a rush. Oh, we need cadence, we need cadence, we need to ship, 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 right? And if you're just shipping things for shipping's sake, right, you might not actually be accomplishing much. You might actually be burying yourself. It turns out that if you add more features, for each feature that doesn't actually do things well, you actually can degrade your service. And so even though you think you're doing more, you're actually kind of going in the wrong direction. And at the bottom it says, data informs the hippo. So HIPPO stands for highest paid person's opinion, right? So how often is the highest paid person's opinion the, the thing that drives what our technically smartest people have to do in the next little while, right? Usually, well, that's why you're there. You're there to give direction. Well, it's good if you can help resolve conflicts or help set up a, a mission. But instead of having the highest paid person opinion be what we're going to do next, what if data could inform the highest paid person so that they can actually um, play a better role rather than merely arbitrarily telling you what you should do, right? So I'm going to use an example, a European example, actually, Booking.com. They're a well publicly documented example of, of using this pattern. Again, these companies have been doing this for a while. So let's see how they describe this. 
This is a blog post uh, published by a guy named Lucas Vermeer. Uh, this is an example of a really great transparent work they do, you know, moving fast, breaking things, and fixing them as quickly as possible. And even though he uses the terms controlled experiments, you're going to see this is actually about how do I ship software faster, how do I increase the cadence, how do I limit the blast radius, and how do I learn while I'm doing it. So they're a great example of manage, monitor, and experiment. So let's start with manage, right? That's to control that, that gradual exposure, right? And decoupling deployment from release. So that's what manage is about, is control of exposure. And, and some ways to look at this, maybe I want to grant early access to people. Maybe I've got some special customers I want to deliberately only give this to them. And actually, I might start with giving access to my developers and my testers and then my employees. That's called dog fooding, when you actually use your own product before you expose it to your customers. So I might want to grant early access. I also might want to limit that blast radius, right? I want, might want to contain how many people are hurt by something that goes wrong. And more interestingly, I might want to define the surface area for learning. So, I was at a talk last night, and the promise was, we're not going to talk a lot about statistics. Well, actually, statistics can do a lot for us to help us not fool ourselves, right? So humans have biases, and we're, we're generally drawn to find what we want to find. Um, and when you're doing learning, you want to have a, a, the largest number of people that can come through makes your statistics more valid, right? So it's called power. So if, I'm, if I want to actually learn uh, and, and have it be very clear and certain, I want to actually put a lot of people through that. So that's, that's a larger surface area. But I might not want to get there until I've made sure I limit my blast radius first. Right? Oh, I need half all of my users to try this. Well, I might want to ramp it to 5% first, and then we'll go there. Right? So it's really about how do I decouple deployment from release. And that's really just saying deploying software to servers is infrastructure, and releasing is actually exposing the functionality to your customer. And this doesn't necessarily mean a visible thing on the screen. It could be an algorithm in the back end, a search algorithm. right? How do I decouple deployment from release? And really more importantly, how do I decouple revert from rollback? So when one of the great questions is like, well, do we have a backup? Uh, have we tried it? You know, um, uh, Discipline companies will have a, a rollback plan for deployment. They'll say, well, if anything goes wrong, here are the steps we will take to get back to where we were. Right? And you'll ask, well, how long does that take? Well, we should be able to do it in 90 minutes. Well, 90 minutes is an awful long time, right? Or we'll do blue-green and we can just switch back. In this case, how do I make decouple, how do I make rolling, how do I make turning something off instant and not related to moving software around to servers? So the technology that, that we employ for this is called a feature flag. And actually, I don't know how many people were in uh, some of the talks yesterday. I was in two talks where feature flags were mentioned quite a few times. And really, the idea behind a feature flag is how do I have a, sort of a dimmer or a, a switch behind my, my, my software so I can turn up or down or turn on and off, and I can focus it at people, right? And actually, I'll go back to that slide really quick. Just If you look there, the first row is 0% exposure. Why would, I, why would I roll my code out to 0% of my users? Well, it's because it's not ready yet. And so there's actually a, a, a programming pattern called trunk-based development, where you actually commit back to the source code every day. If you're taking two weeks to build something and you're committing every day, you've got stuff that's not finished yet, right? And so feature flags are essential for that, but they're even better for anyone who's just pushing anything at all. I might go to 10%, try it out, go to 20%, etc. cetera, right? So that's, that's really this control thing. So let's look at booking.com. They call this asynchronous feature release. And they're separating the deployment from the, from the release, right? And this is the only code example you'll see in my entire talk, which is they're, they're wrapping a particular piece of functionality with a function call and saying, before I run this code, I'm going to go see if I should. And if the answer is yes, I will. If there's not, I'll move on, right? That's really all you have to know about feature flags. It's just a way to, to conditionally decide, should I show this to a particular user? And if I do, I'm going to run that code. If I'm not, I'm, I'm going to do something else. It's not a giant framework or refactoring all your code, right? So here's what their experience has been by using this approach. First of all, deploying has no impact on user experience. Deploying doesn't make things blow up, right? Releasing does. So they find they deploy more frequently with less risk to the business and to the users. So they're not afraid to deploy, and developers are not afraid to try things. And so the big win is agility. They actually find that they ship more often, they do more stuff, because it's less, they're less likely to bring the system down. So let's move on to monitor. In the case of monitor, we want to detect unforeseen issues quickly, and we want to limit the blast radius, right? And what they call this at Booking.com is their safety net. And each feature is, each feature is wrapped in an experiment. Whether they're trying to like, learn something or not, no matter what they do, it's wrapped in one of these things, right? And it allows them to monitor and stop changes. But what's interesting is that, so how many people work in an environment where, where we try to focus a team on something? We call it the two-pizza team, right? 
the idea behind a small team is they actually know what they're doing. They know what they're doing this week. They know what's changing. If you actually have a team that hands something off to complete strangers, they don't know the whole context, right? So they have this model where they want the team to be in control. So their team is the one responsible for watching the rollout and controlling it, regardless of how the code got there. No matter who deploys the code, the team that actually built the feature is the one that turns it on and watches to see if it's okay. Now, this is where it gets a little science fiction. Well, actually, let's, let's cover this first, which is why does this matter? So if you're only rolling out, little math, if you, if you, if you roll out a change to 5% of your population, and 20% of those users get an error, one in five users get an error, okay? That's a big problem, one in five users get an error. But let's do the math. What percentage of your total user population is getting that error? If I'm only rolling out to 5% of the users, and, right? 1%, exactly. So, Let's take a look at that graphically, right? So here's just sort of a graph in the network operating center of some ambient noise and error level in the, in the overall system, right? And if I introduce a 1% error, it's going to be down in there somewhere. Am I going to see it? I'm not going to see it, probably. It's going to go unnoticed until we ramp higher and higher and higher, right? So one thing that's cool about these systems is what if I just watch the 5% instead of all of them and pay attention there? I'm going to see a 20% error rate, right? So it's kind of an intuitively obvious thing, but most people don't have the ability to watch that 5% separate from the rest of the users, right? So this is where, this is the science fiction part I was alluding to, circuit breaker. So at Booking.com, when they make a mistake that's so glaringly obvious that they don't need the team to decide whether it's broken or not, they have an automatic way to stop it. So for the first three minutes of a feature release, they have this thing where if they see severe de degradation, they automatically abort that feature. And this breaks their normal model of letting the team be in control. It's kind of a big brother thing. But when you hear about how fast this works, you'll get it. So they, they say if something is so obviously broken, they want to fix it. So the time between detecting there's a problem and resolving it, which is often known as mean time to detect or mean time to resolve, is inside of one second. One second, no war room, right? Literally, they turn off the problem and then figure out what happened. So that is out there. I don't, I don't commit that you could all figure that out in your own system. They built a very actually large monolith that does all this for them. But that's, that's what's possible. And say, what if it were five minutes instead of three hours, right? It's, it's a quality of life thing. This is what their circuit breaker looks like. You know, the, the, the sort of a dashboard of rolling out the feature. And if something goes wrong, you know, the, the, person, the team that's rolling this out says, hey, sorry about this, but we shut your thing off. Here's why. Try again. You know, let's move on. So uh, almost done with the sort of the model, right? A uh, uh, manage model, uh, uh, manage, uh, sorry, manage, monitor, and experiment. An experiment, we want to confirm the impact of something we're doing. We, we intend to accomplish something. Did we do it? Like, did, we actually, did it actually happen? So they, they describe this as a way to validate ideas. And they will measure in a very controlled manner. And we'll talk about what that means in a minute. If you're familiar with statistics, control means something. Um, the impact that changes are having on user behavior. And every change they do has an objective, which means they have to actually, their process forces them to actually state a hypothesis. I am making this change because I think this is going to happen. And if you think that like formulating this is kind of hard, it's actually a super simple formula. Because we've seen this, we believe that if we change that, this will happen. It's literally like three things you have to stop and think about, right? But every change they make has one of these things described, right? And it allows them to validate that the desired outcome is achieved, which actually gives people, it doesn't make it harder to do your job, it makes it more satisfying to do your job. It's frustrating if you try something that doesn't work, but now you have data to iterate on and you can try again. And then when it actually does make a difference, you know you've actually done it. It's not just an opinion. So the feature flag, in this case, you're actually, um, here I've got the population split 50-50, right? And it doesn't mean I've got half of all my users. It could be that I'm taking maybe just my free users or my 18 to 35-year-old users or my users in a particular geography that I want to try some idea with, right? And I'm going to expose functionality to half of them, and the other half I'm going to sort of do control. I'm not going to show anything different to them, right? In this case, we're trying to get them to create more tasks. And the great news is that an 11% change in something in a large system is actually a huge number. Imagine if that was a conversion rate, right? It's a lot of difference, right? But I also want to know if something else is going to happen. And in this case, um, what if the page load time goes up by 25% for that cohort, right? Would you roll this out to the rest of the users yet? So I want to introduce something called a guardrail metric. And this is one of these best practices. As you'll find these companies have been around for a while. They have this. Guard, guardrails are on the edge of roads, right? And the idea behind a guardrail is if you get a little distracted or you, or you get sleepy and you kind of start to go off the road, you'll bang into this rail. And you might get a dent in your car, but you're not going to fall off a cliff. 
right? So you kind of get put back on, on course. Well, the deal with the guardrail metric is, let's say I'm a, I'm a developer. I want to make tasks happen. So I have a local incentive. I actually want to make that happen. And I'm not, my job isn't to know about everything else the company cares about all the time. I'm trying to make the tasks happen, right? But if I'm rolling out this release, it's probably useful to know that I've actually increased the page load time. And so what a guardrail metric is something that you automatically track without the developer having to do anything. Right? The local team doesn't actually have to decide to track page load time. They might be smart enough and nice enough to do so. But when you have guardrail metrics, these are things that you watch all the time anyway with no, psychic, no, 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 no psychological overhead on your, on your, on your developers. Right? The developers don't have to worry about that because you're going to watch it for them. Right? That's what a guardrail metric is. Okay, so I, I give you kind of a real quick example of what these things are, and I want to take us in a slightly different direction now. Uh, and before I do, I'm just going to sum up what booking said the value they get out of this, right? And this is, gets back to quality of life, and if, to, if you're going to turn that crank, how much do you get out of it? So the quicker we manage to validate new ideas, the less time is wasted on things that don't work. How many people here have worked on a project that got shelved after, say, six months of work? Right? I'm going to raise two hands, right? It's not a lot of fun, right? You work, 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 and that didn't really work out, and this whole thing gets shelved, right? Um, more time is left to work on the things that do make a difference. So this is a quality of life thing. This is actually a productivity thing. This is, you know, it's more fun to work in an environment where you're getting stuff done and you're not spending a lot of time going nowhere, right? So let's switch gears now and look at another company, LinkedIn. So I'm going to use this as an example of going from sort of building your own multiple, uh, sorry, minimal viable product to a trusted system for doing this. Booking.com has an extremely advanced system. It's crazy fast. It's an amazing scale. Let's look at another one, right? At LinkedIn, they have something called Excellent. And at the beginning, it was kind of a modest start for Excellent, right? They built a targeting engine that could split traffic between existing and new code. And the impact analysis was all done by hand. So they would beg a favor from somebody. It would take about two weeks to get the answers, right? And so as a result, they almost never did it. They almost never actually looked at the results. They, they used this to sort of roll these things out and hope they didn't blow things up, but they didn't actually study the results very well. And so as a result, what they had was basically the feature flags for control to manage, but no monitoring per se, at least not specific to them, and, and definitely not experimentation, right? Well, today, they launch a controlled experiment with built-in observability every five minutes, 100 of them a day. Right? So all day long, they're firing these things out that actually are watching themselves for you. It's kind of like the needle phoning out from the haystack. Like, I'm just out to this many users, but here's what's happening. Right? And if you look at the bottom there, there's this metrics you follow. That's an internal product they built. That's not some commercial thing. That's a dashboard where any user in the company can say, I, as a stakeholder, care about some metric. Maybe it's uh, subscriptions to the newsletter, or it's new account signups, whatever and you subscribe to these things. I want to follow this metric. And then anybody in the entire company runs an experiment which moves that metric up or down, you get alerted proactively. You get a Slack or a hip chat or an email or something that basically says, hey, uh, Bob's doing this thing that's actually making subscriptions go way down. You might want to check in with Bob. Or, wow, Sally is doing this amazing thing, right? So, so that's a very mature evolution. They've actually gone all the way from barely being able to get it done to launching a new one every five minutes. And they had some lessons they learned. This is Yao Zhu. She was hired as an individual data scientist, and she now runs this whole group. And she spoke at a conference that, that Split helped organize in San Francisco in 2018 called Decisions. And she said the things they learned were you've got to, if you're going to build this, you've got to build it for scale. So they used to literally coordinate over email. So when they wanted to do one of these things, what they'd do is they'd use the last two digits of her user ID to put you in a bucket, okay? So, and, and they would then argue over which range of, of numbers they, each team could have for an experiment. I would do that over email. I want 36 through 42, right? You know, and obviously, you can't get to 100 launches a day if you're negotiating over email for how those buckets work, right? The second thing they ran into is the need to make it trustworthy. So targeting, um, we talked about just now, targeting was kind of a a manual hassle, and analysis. So they, when they started building the smarts to do the, the sense making of this, the analysis part, um, it was very inconsistent. So you'd go in one day and it'd say, great news, 50% lift in the number. You are a hero. You're awesome. So you go home and you sort of tell your family, this is great, this is happening. And you come in the next day and you say, hey, boss, I got I to gotta have five minutes with you and I want to sit down and show you something. And so you bring up the dashboard and show your boss and, and it says, you're down 50%. This thing hurts the 
hurts your outcomes 50%. You're like, wait a minute. Like yesterday it was 50% up, today it's 50% down. So there's horrible inconsistencies. And I don't know about you, but if you had a system like that, would you use it? Well, you wouldn't want to use that. Like that would just make your life harder, right? So they realized they had to make the analysis rock solid and repeatable. And then the last thing is they had to design it for diverse teams. Most companies will have some clever piece of technology and associated with that technology is a wizard, maybe two wizards, right? And as a result, there's a bottleneck and there's also kind of one person's version of the truth, right? But if you can design it for diverse teams, if everybody has access to this and everybody's using this, then they all begin to believe each other and they also have a common language for talking to each other, right? So these were the sort of three big takeaways they had. Now, turns out that these platforms exist at quite a few companies, right? And if you look at Microsoft, LinkedIn, and Uber, you wouldn't be surprised that those guys are putting a lot of time and money and energy into this. They've spent literally tens of millions of dollars a year to build and maintain the solution. And if you look at this kind of continuum, you have this sort of step one, which is just having feature flags so you can be nimble and turn things on and off, right? Step two is having sort of sensors or correlation, the ability to kind of pay attention to how things are going both at the system and at the user level and be able to kind of observe. Step three is having a stats engine so you can go from just correlation to causation. Because if you're being disciplined with your stats, you can actually rule out random effects. You can rule out that this just happened because it just happened and actually see, well, you know what? Sending these people that way, sending these people that way, and these people have a very different experience, and so many of them have gone through that I'm pretty confident that that's not random, right? So that's step three. And then the holy grail at the top is actually having the ability to visualize all this, having a management console, having this not be a wizard's tool, uh, um, and, and, you know, Facebook, LinkedIn, Microsoft all have systems that they use internally that are, you saw the LinkedIn GUI, right? Like, they, they've, they've evolved this, right? So the problem is this is really expensive, and it's really hard. It takes many years and many, many developers to build this kind of stuff. And that is exactly how the company I work for came into existence. That's why we created Split. And there's actually kind of an interesting story behind this. This, this is Audel. He's our CEO. And Audel worked at LinkedIn, right? And at LinkedIn, he had the advantage of being able to use Excellent, right? which he became normal for him and he loved it, right? Then he went somewhere else. So what's the problem? He goes somewhere else and he's missing this tool. He doesn't have this tool anymore. So he, he begs his boss, he says, you know, let me build a product like that. And it was very hard to get the resources to build something. They said, well, you can take one shot at building something kind of basic, but don't get crazy. And so he built like an MVP of this at a company called Relate IQ. And um, then there was this incident where it was kind of hard to talk to people into using this, but he talked to a few people into using this. And one day a developer came to him and said, said Oh my God, I can't believe it. I pushed my change and all over the world, everywhere, everyone's just seeing a blank white screen when they go to our website. This is sort of the white screen of death. You, some of you know about the blue screen of death on a PC, but in a browser, if you go to a page and it just comes up as a white blob, it's not good, right? And they said, well, did you put it behind uh, one of these splits, one of these, these switches? Well, yes. Well, why don't you just switch it back? Oh yeah. So he goes back and he switches it back and inside of a minute, everybody's got their browser back, right? So pretty profound experience, right? This would have been a huge fire drill of, oh my God, what are we going to do? And it just became a flip the switch and everything was fine again. So what happened was that when Relate IQ got bought by Salesforce for a handy sum of money, Audel and a couple of his coworkers had something new to do and they had, a, they had an angel who would fund them to get a company started. And that's how we, how we started Split in October of 2015. And, you know, we basically use this model, manage, monitor, and experiment. So, this is a quick shot of our website, right? So manage every feature. How do I control who gets what and be able to change it easily? How do I monitor when something's going to go wrong and get alerts? How do I experiment at scale? How do I actually reliably do lots of these experiments and know that I have trustworthy data? And the thing is, this is not just about one company. This is a community, and it's much bigger than any, any of us. And so on our blog, we tend to have stuff that's not just about us, but what's going on. So there's a recent post, you know, to stage or not to stage, moving fast to production. And I'll show you um, something about that in just a sec. There's another one, how to avoid lying to yourself with statistics. This is actually, Jorn, when I met you at Pinterest, we met in the lobby at Pinterest. I had actually given a talk at Pinterest. They invited me in to give a talk about best practices, how to avoid lying to yourself with stats. They have their own platform. They're not looking to buy my platform, but they thought we could collaborate on, on how, how how can we do this stuff? And, and, and that's how we kind of keep the community going. And then last, you know, this on a mission to kill release nights. Nobody really likes those. So Jez Humble, if you know the story about continuous delivery, Jez Humble and Dave Farley, one of the reasons they did that was they were sick and tired of releasing software late at night, of like having to stay late just to release. You're supposed to be releasing often, but like every time I do this, I have to miss dinner and not see my family. 
Like, right? so, so how do we get away from this release night? And uh, we had some, uh, one of our founders, Pato, he actually does what he calls data journalism, where he digs through our data, and he wrote a blog post, which I'll show you a graph from in a sec. So, you know, if you're interested in this notion of testing in production, and is that really sane, is that possible, how do I do that, you should Google Talianassi testing in production. This guy works for WeWork. Um, she is a split customer. She gives a talk to QA audiences about how do I set up this whole thing? How do, what do I do about test data? What do I do about, you know, how do we really do this? How do I convince the team to do this? What are the prerequisites to being able to do this thing? Great video that she did here um, at, at React Alicante. So you can check that out. Um, and then you can watch my, my talk that I give at Pinterest. It's on our blog. Um, uh, so that's available as well. And then here's the, here's the data about killing the release night. So this is a graph. Time of, time of day, and it's over here you have, you know, the 7.5, that's 7.30 in the morning. Uh, and uh, you can notice that, uh, and what this is, is this is the, the blue is when someone makes a change to a split. They make change the rules for who should get what. And the, the light blue is actually creating a split in the first place. The, the important one here is this pink one, which is killing. That's a, that's a oh my god, that's a, hitting the panic button, right? And if you look at this, it's pretty fascinating. Uh, working hours, takes a break for lunch. Kind of a humane environment, sustainable thing, taking a break for lunch. And then actually the rest of the workday, and then it tapers off when people are going home. This doesn't have a giant spike of activity in, it, at 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. or 2 in the morning, right? So this is actually hard data of people who are using this approach, and they're actually succeeding in killing their release night. So um, I thought that was kind of a, a cool thing. That's on our blog as well. So just to sum it up. One of the, I thought the keynote talking about fun, the role of fun, right? Like if, if, you know, it's a job, yes, it's a job, but actually if what you do is satisfying, it's fun, it doesn't like crush your soul, like it's more fun to go back to work and do it again, right? And so whatever you're gonna do, like how do you figure out, like it's nice to be able to be a good one at it. Like how do you actually make sure that what you're doing is gonna be effective and, and that you're not hurting your users and that you're actually moving forward, right? And that's really why I give this talk which is I just want you to have a little bit of tools in your arsenal. Whether you, wanna, whether you have a big tools team and you want to go out and build this, I hope that you've got enough of a framework here, and I've got another talk that gives you checklists and stuff. And if you actually are looking for a commercial solution you can adopt, obviously split is an option. There are a few other options out there. We all kind of have the different focuses on what we're trying to do. Our focus is on, an, on amplifying the power of an engineer, it's sort of an engineering-focused thing. How do I actually help the engineers be more effective, get more stuff uh, out to the world, and have the customers be happy? That's my talk, and I hope you got some kind of value out of that.